Hi, and welcome to lecture two of Spectrum Economics and Market Tools. I'm Sarah O. Lamb, um, a senior fellow at the Technology Policy Institute in Washington, D.C., and um, a lawyer and PhD economist in, in Spectrum Economics. Um, so today, lecture two on, will be on Spectrum Economics. I'll be talking about a history of auctions, spectrum auctions, and spectrum valuation methods, um, outlining how accountants might value spectrum licenses that are held on balance sheets of companies, and as well as spectrum valuation factors used by economists to estimate the value of licenses in future auctions and um, current holdings. So for a history of auctions, um, in 1996, the U.S. Telecommunications Act um, kind of authorized spectrum auctions fully. Um, there were spectrum auctions prior to the 1996 Telecom Act, um, but this really um, started the FCC's um, program in auctions. Here's an image of the FCC report to Congress on how these auctions were going. Prior to the 90s, um, Spectrum was allocated on a command and control basis based on what the FCC thought was best. Um, they can be called beauty pageants where, um, you know, more like grant applications, the regulator considered all different qualitative um, components of an allocation distribution, but there was no bidding or market prices or competitive um, dynamics until auctions um, were introduced. There was a lottery system um, in the early 90s where it was kind of random lottery um, and, and before the 90s as well. Um, thinking that that might be a more equi equitable distribution of licenses. Um, but auctions were um, implemented in order to help um, licenses go to the highest bidder um, in, in a discovery process to find out who could be the most valuable user of the spectrum. So here's an image of the FCC report to Congress. You can look it up. Um, in the FCC's docket, here's a URL to the whole report, and they reported back to Congress on how the first auctions went. In this report, um, here's a quote from um, the report uh, from a source in um, a, a publication. They say, the new auction paradigm has drawn entry and new financing into telecommunications markets and has spurred the marketing of new technologies and the building of transmission capacity to meet growing demand. And so the report is very positive about the application of auctions to Spectrum. Um, here's a picture of the chairman of the FCC during that time when the FCC started adopting auctions. Um, Bill Kennard was chairman of the FCC from 1997 to 2001. Um, and he was there for a very influential period of time when the Telecom Act of 96 was first being implemented. Michael Powell was also a commissioner of the FCC during that time, 97 to 2005. And he was chairman of the FCC from 2001 to 2005. And so he followed um, Kennard um, right after. And so um, prior to him, um, Kennard was a Democrat and Michael Powell a Republican. Um, Michael Powell is currently head of the um, NCTA, the Cable Association, and his father is well known as um, the Colin Powell, um, who recently passed away. But Chairman Powell um, oversaw a lot of different spectrum auctions. So here's a table of the top um, auctions in the last few years and the total amount of bids that have been put forth. Um, you can see um, the C-band like we discussed in the last um, lecture 
clocked in at $81 billion in bids. And that happened in 2020 and 2021. Um, that auction number 107 um, is was in the 3.7 gigahertz band. Um, 5,684 licenses were auctioned. Um, and those were all won. And so sometimes, even though um, bid uh, uh, licenses are auctioned, they're not won or bid upon. Um, but in the C van, they were all all distributed. Um, this happened over 97 rounds, and um, and and yeah, had a record breaking number of amount of interest um, from wireless companies that bid on these licenses. Um, the value of the 3.7 gigahertz band is in 5G service that will be rolled out soon. Um, the two other large auctions that came in behind um, the C-band auction were auction 97, which was AD AWS 3, and that was the largest up till the C-band auction at $41 billion. Um, that was 1,600 licenses auctioned in over 341 rounds. Um, in back in 2014 and 2015. And then coming behind that, um, another uh, 3.45 gigahertz band. So that's also 5G. And that happened after the C band. So 2021 to 2022. Um, and that raised $22 billion um, in bids with 4,000 licenses auctioned. And then you can see the other um, auctions below that happened um, in the 2000s, um, attracting $19 billion, $18 billion of bids. Those two, um, the 600 megahertz band, that was an incentive auction of broadcast spectrum. At the time, 19 billion was a very large number, um, but they, that number has since been eclipsed by the C band auction. Um, and then you have the PCS and AWS-1 auctions um, in 2000 and 2006. You also have PCS in 1995. And these are the PCS auctions um, are wireless spectrum for cellular that a lot of, um, that really kicked off um, wi mobile wireless networks as we know them right now. Um, auction 103, the upper 37, 39, and 47 gigahertz um, bands. Um, I think that's the Spectrum Horizons bands um, or Spectrum Frontier, one of the two. Um, and, and those weren't as large, those seven billion dollars, um, but a lot of small auction, a lot of small band licenses, 14,000. Um, and that took place in 2019 to 2020. Um, and so you can see going down the line, um, more PCS, 3.5 gigahertz band. Um, I believe that is the CBRS uh, band in 2020. It raised $4.5 billion in, in auction proceeds. And a lot of small licenses, the priority access licenses, PILs, so 22,000 licenses auction, 20,001 over 76 rounds. So we'll talk about the CBRS auction a little bit later. And going down PCS, broadband PCS. Oh, and here's Spectrum Frontiers at 24 gigahertz. Um, so yeah, actually upper 37, 39, 47 gigahertz, that's Spectrum Horizons. Um, so each of these Spectrum auctions has kind of a shorthand name um, in order to keep track of what's happening. Um, but you can see the timeframes, the dates, and um, I just um, put together a summary from the FCC website. And for your um, student presentations, this is the URL, the website that you can pick an auction from this list and talk about it. So um, yeah, this is a good starting point for your student presentations. Pick an auction um, and, and you can even Google search it and find a lot of news articles. Make sure it's the right one, um, but it won't be too hard to find because the dates, there's usually like one spectrum auction per year. Um, some years there were two, but there's usually one big one per year. So you can find different headlines about um, predictions and um, expectations for before the auction. And then there are news articles during the auction as it's happening. And then there are usually um, 
yeah, headlines about the final results afterwards. Here's another diagram showing um, just how large the auctions are compared to each other in terms of total auction revenue. And so one of my um, co-authors and actually my boss um, at TPI, Scott Walston, he put together this figure for a paper um, that he wrote in 2017 um, showing circle size represents auction revenues and the different auction numbers um, by FCC auction, the early ones, and then all the way up to 97. So this chart doesn't have like all the way going up to 110 or um, the incentive auction, but you can see um, on the y-axis is a figure called dollars per megahertz pop. And we'll talk about that. That's one way to quantify um, a unit measure of the price for uh, for the spectrum megahertz, and then also with a population um, normalization. And so by normalizing to a unit measure, we can compare across the licenses and the auctions. And so you can see how big some of um, the auctions really were compared to each other. AWS 3 was very large by megahertz, dollars per megahertz pop and total revenues. And so you can see that big circle up in the top right. Um, but PCS was also large in the early days. Um, and then you can see AWS 1 down there. Um, AWS 1 had lower um, dollars per megahertz pop unit measures, but large auction revenues in total. Um, so in the history of auctions, we should also talk about how complicated they can be as well. Um, complicated in terms of sophisticated. And um, one reason why I showed the Nobel Prize winners in lecture one is that a lot of the groundwork for these auctions happened in the economics literature. Um, combinatorial bidding, no, also known as package bidding, um, allows bidders to place groups of bids together. The reason why um, you would need a package bidding is that um, there are often complementarities between licenses. And so um, bidders might want a whole bundle of licenses more than individual um, bundles. And one of the goals of an auction is to really move licenses to the highest valued users. And so if you can get the licenses to bidders who really want them more, but they really want them in bundles, then um, bundling them together would be better for everybody um, and would be better to raise greater auction revenues, not just for the treasury, but um, to, to really discover who would value this, the licenses the most, who would bid the most for them. So in order to really um, facilitate competition, this combinatorial or package bidding has been implemented by the FCC. And so um, this is one innovation that was implemented and tested by these earlier auctions. So 1997, um, it's been reviewed and watched and tweaked over time. So these are also um, more descriptions of what happens in these multiple round auctions. Um, they're simultaneous in order so that um, there's no strategic like uh, uh, discovery of prices. So they need to be simultaneous um, and payments have to be um, have to occur upfront in order for bidders to be sincere and financially prepared to win a license. So you want to make sure that bidders are um, bidding, their true values and sincerely in auctions in order for everything to come out to a conclusion that um, that you wouldn't have to redo it or that bidders wouldn't default and um, and not be able to pay up. And so all these different um, tweaks are needed to run a good auction. Um, in in the technique of running this auction, the upfront payments are not attributed to specific licenses, but instead um, bidders are given numbers of bidding units 
that they're permitted to bid on single rounds. And the bidding units correspond to their upfront payment. And so um, the commission applies the payment towards the winning bid amount. Um, and if the bidder doesn't win any licenses, then the upfront payment will be refunded. Here's um, a look at um, an early auction, auction 35. And um, Bulo and Milgram did a study on the, these rounds. Um, and this contributed to their, uh, Milgram's winning the Nobel Prize as part of his scholarship. And here you can see um, different dynamics between the bidders and the bidding rounds um, and how in early early rounds um, there there comes stability is revealed pretty early on. Um, and so as early on as round um, round 13, um, you can see that bids are, exposure um, stabilizes. Um, you can read the paper for more information, um, but this chart also shows you um, some of the bidders and how they compete in, in um, how they competed in auction 35. Back in, in this year of the, of the auction, you had bidders like AT&T, Nextel, Celco doing business as Verizon Wireless, um, a provider uh, T-Mobile, which was doing business, uh, or which was under a company called Cook Inlet. You have Sprintcom. I, I suppose that became Sprint later. Um, and other smaller providers that I haven't heard of lately. Um, oh, Salmon PCS or Singular. You have Voice Stream PCS, Leap Wireless. And you have bidding consortium or bidding companies. Um, that might be representing other larger um, bidders. Here's another chart from that paper um, on bidder exposure in auction 66. And you see um, different dynamics around, um, around also 13. Um, you have Singular in here, company called Dolan Family Holdings, Leap Wireless or Cricket, Celco Partnership, doing business as Verizon Wireless, T-Mobile, Metro PCS, Spectrum Co. So more recently, um, here's a headline about um, a recent 5G auction, auction 110. Um, AT&T and DISH were the big winners um, in early 2022 this year. And the FCC raised more than 22 billion for mid-band spectrum that had previously been used by the military. Um, so I think in, in our chart, we can go back. Our table, auction 110 was the 3.45 gigahertz um, auction. And yeah, that raised 22 billion back in 2021. So for your presentations, you can find, you can even use this article, um, present it. Um, more on the 3.45 gigahertz auction. Here is an announcement from the FCC where the chairwoman, Jessica Rosenworcel, um, welcomes a broad array of bidders in the 5G spectrum auction. So um, this is for 5G spectrum and 13 of 23 companies with winning bids qualified as small businesses. Um, so there are also public policy considerations um, in in the bidding credits and eligible bidders um, and small businesses um, entity, as well as entities serving rural communities. Um, and you can see that there is more competition in this auction. Over one third of the top 100 markets had at least four winning bidders compared to 10% of the top 100 markets in a prior auction 107. So, um, and here is more about the top bidders in auction 110. Um, the five bidders with the largest total gross winning bid amounts um, were AT&T um, with $9 billion um, put forth towards winning that spectrum. You have a company, uh, Wymanoush, I never heard of them. They might, I don't know who they're representing. T-Mobile, 345 Spectrum and U.S. Cellular Corp. 
and bidders with the largest number of licenses, maybe not total gross amount of bids, but numbers. You see AT&T um, won 1,624 licenses um, and, and others. T-Mobile um, only won 199 licenses, but they um, bid $2 billion. So that tells you the licenses they won were very valuable. So you can imagine um, the licenses in New York City um, are very valuable by market or LA, the big metro um, areas. And then you can have lots of small licenses in rural areas that might not be as, as valuable or as um, expensive in price. So this gives you an idea of the economics behind spectrum licenses, how valuable they are to uh, wireless bidders. Um, and so now we get to kind of an accounting section. Um, I think it's important to think about how uh, an intangible asset like a spectrum license is, is measured or valued um, in a financial sense um, by accounting rules. And so um, if you look at the annual reports and the securities filings of publicly traded uh, telecom companies, they define their spectrum licenses under indefinitely lived intangible assets. And they use valuation methods under the GAAP rules, G-A-A-P, the accounting rules. And they explain that there are two different approaches for valuing intangible assets. There's a market approach or M&A approach um, that looks at uh, acquisitions and um, mergers and acquisitions and other transactions. So actual purchases of um, similar uh, assets, they look at those prices and they compare it with their current holdings. And then there's an income approach or greenfield approach where um, an accountant can forecast future cash flows from the asset or future income and then um, and um, forecast in the future how much that would be worth today in a discounted cash flow model. And so the greenfield approach just takes the asset um, as it is without looking at comparatives. Um, and so those are two approaches. And I think um, there's room for hybrid approaches as well, combining both of these like comparative values plus an income approach, especially when doing forecasts for future auctions. So here's some language in the AT&T 2021 annual report where you can see how they think about their spectrum holdings. Um, and I'll just read a description of their impairment testing. And so under um, gap rules, they do need to impair, um, apply impairment testing, um, which is like a depreciation method. So the fair value of US wireless licenses um, by AT&T is assessed using a discounted cash flow model, the Greenfield approach, and a qualitative collaborative market approach. So they're using both based on auction prices, depending upon auction activity. The Greenfield approach assumes a company initially owns only the wireless licenses and makes investments required to build an operation comparable to current use. These licenses are tested annually for impairment on an aggregated basis, consistent with, consistent with their use on a national scope for the US. For impairment testing, we assume subscriber and revenue growth will trend up to projected levels with long-term growth rate reflecting expected long-term inflation trends. We assume churn rates will initially exceed our current experience, but decline to rates that are in line with industry-leading churn. We use a discount rate of 9.25% based on the optimal long-term capital structure of a market participant and its associated cost of debt and equity for the licenses to calculate the present value of the projected cash flows. If either the projected rate of long-term growth of cash flows or revenues declined by 0.5%, or if the discount rate increased by 0.5%, the fair values of these wireless licenses would still be higher than the book value of the licenses. The fair value of these wireless licenses exceeded their book values by more than 10%. So I, I encourage you, if you haven't um, seen company annual reports or filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, 
there's just a wealth of knowledge in there. You can learn about a lot about the businesses behind wireless networks by reading um, the company's annual reports. Um, they're a lot more detailed than um, other documents and they're filed with, they're, they're available online at the SEC's website. Um, their database is called Edgar, E-D-G-A-R, and they file, you know, all the required forms that they need to as a publicly traded company. So in, in the annual report, they also have balance sheets, consolidated balance sheets that show all the assets held by the company. So here you can see the wireless licenses, the spectrum um, is under licenses-net, and that's as an asset, an intangible asset. Um, and um, there, the AT&T has um, $113 billion worth of spectrum assets. This is 113,000 million, so um, that's billion. They also have um, other, um, in, you know, intangible assets and intellectual property, like um, you can see trademarks and other intangible assets and operating lease right of use assets. Um, and you can see their total assets. They obviously have cash um, and accounts receivable inventories, um, but a lot of their Assets are goodwill, um, which is a little bit of a catch-all um, asset amount, or when they purchase, um, acquire uh, assets from other companies, they'll put them on the books as goodwill um, if they don't. The 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 pro the the differential. Um, and so here's a picture of license spectrum assets on AT and T's consolidated balance sheet. Here's another table from that um, annual report, and you can see the wireless licenses broken out um, among intangible assets. And these are broken out in terms of amorti um, amortized, amortized intangible assets and not amortized. Um, and so some of the wireless licenses are amortized, others are not. And I highlighted in yellow um, the wireless licenses um, most of their wireless licenses are not subject to amortization. Some are, um, and so you can see um, $111 billion worth um, of spectrum. They also have orbital slots, but not this year, only last year, 2020, or in 2020. Um, AT&T has trademarks, distribution networks, and they have weighted average lifespans for the amortization calculations. Um, they have TV and film content, consumer lists and relationships and other, and then indefinitely lived intangible assets not subject to amortization is mostly wireless licenses um, and also trade names. So spectrum licenses um, are, are in that category of kind of like intellectual property, kind of like real property, but it, but not not real property, um, they're intangible, but they're still valuable, especially if they wanted to sell them on a secondary market um, or if they need to be um, incentivized to reallocate to another use. Another way that we think about the value of um, spectrum is in price per megahertz pop. And um, here's a chart of Price per megahertz pop. Um, oh, well, this is a, a table that helps you um, calculate the price per megahertz pop. And again, we have auctions um, listed in terms of the gross bids and the year. Um, I also have here the frequency bands, the start megahertz and end megahertz, the frequency. So, and you can see how wide the band is in each of these auctions. So in the first, in auction 97, AWS 3, it really was only a 65 megahertz um, band that was up for auction. Um, it started at 1695, 1.6 gigahertz up to 2.1 gigahertz. 
or 1695 megahertz to 2180 megahertz. Um, but it wasn't the whole swath, um, but within, um, within that spectrum, oh, sorry, you have a bandwidth of 65 megahertz that was um, auctioned off and um, you got, it, it um, attracted $44 billion of bids. Um, in auction 73, you also see that it was lower on the spectrum dial at 698 megahertz to 806 megahertz, um, but a similar amount of bandwidth was auctioned off 62 megahertz. Um, and that um, attracted 90, $19 billion worth of bids. And if you just read down the table, um, you know, these little slivers of spectrum are very valuable only 30 megahertz or 30 megahertz here or there for PCS, the different blocks. Um, and then you see larger um, amounts of spectrum, like 1300 megahertz in the auction 17 LMDS. Um, but that's really high up the dial at 27 gigahertz, 27,500 megahertz and 31,300 megahertz. Um, you also see in 2000, the 39 gigahertz uh, auction, um, auction 30, um, that's all the way up on the dial. And, and it's a lot of spectrum. It's, it's 1400 megahertz or 1 1.4 gigahertz, but it didn't attract a lot of um, bids, like only $467 million worth of bids. And so there is wide variation in the value of spectrum um, according to the marketplace. And so industry users or wireless companies, they want access to the spectrum, um, but different parts of the spectrum are much more valuable to them than others as seen by these prices. So, you know, before 1996, before 1994, um, there weren't prices attached to these licenses. Um, that was the days of the government just giving them out um, the licenses. So the TV broadcast stations did not have to pay for their, um, did not have to compete or pay for their, their spectrum. Um, they were granted the, their rights. Um, but after the fact, or in a more uh, market-based approach and, and when wireless networks are so important and valuable, you see these numbers going up and up and up. Um, and you know, it also includes inflation over the years. Um, but you also see that the wireless, the mobile economy, um, wireless economy is bigger too. So there's just so much more value in using the airwaves, um, obviously through the iPhone and through smartphones, we're using mobile phones so much more um, than, a, than, than before the 90s. And so you see a lot more economic activity happening on the spectrum. And so, but this is only just a, a small picture of all the radio spectrum that's used. Um, this is mostly mobile, wireless, and small bandwidths. Um, in, a, I guess, the next lecture, I'll show you the famous spectrum allocation table um, where you see all the different uses on the spectrum, and you have a lot of government use, um, Defense Department use, radar, and, and those are bigger um, bigger swaths of spectrum, but um, they're not really priced to be on the open market. And they might be, you know, not even valued. They're very valuable, even more than $44 billion. Um, they're so valuable that they're not auctioned, um, that they're held by the Defense Department. Um, but even that is a discussion that, um, you know, a lot of the federal government spectrum is not being used very well. And so the commercial sector um, is asking for um, that spectrum to be used um, by, by the commercial sector. And so there is like a national interest in having economic activity on unused resources. And so that's a big policy question about how, um, how to convince the federal government to find spectrum to release to the commercial sector. And so um, the history of AWS one and three is actually, it was federal spectrum that was finally um, released to the commercial sector, but it takes a lot of um, political jockeying and um, 
cooperation between agencies and Congress and um, the private sector to have have this reallocation happen. Um, and here's a, a chart that shows just, um, yeah, how much political activity is around finding um, spectrum and valuing it and getting it into the private sector, um, out into the um, spectrum auctions. Um, there are a lot of bills in Congress introduced, and some of them have made it into public law. Um, a lot of them are um, attached to larger bills like Appropriations Acts and Budget Acts um, and NDA, National Defense Authorization Acts. Um, a lot of spectrum bills are too small or controversial to be passed on their own, so oftentimes they're attached to larger vehicles. Um, but some of these bills have been introduced um, year after year in order to help um, help that alloc the reallocation process or that interchange between federal and non-federal spectrum. So you see that um, in 2011, 2012, there was a Spectrum Inventory Act. Um, the Spectrum Pipeline Act of 2015 was really important to create um, a pipeline um, procedure to bring unused spectrum held by the federal government into the commercial um, arena. Um, and a part of that is because the federal government has a lot of spectrum that they don't use, um, but um, it's hard to get the agencies to give it up um, because they um, they say they'll need it later or, um, yeah, there are just a lot of po politics. Um, there's also a spectrum relocation fund that was created um, that would collect revenue or that would be funded by auction revenues and would be used to help federal agencies replace their equipment. Um, so it would compensate them for upgrading their equipment to clear the spectrum in order to auction it off to wireless or to you know more modern uses. Um, and so this requires a lot of involvement by Congress because it's government um, spectrum. And so it's a relic of earlier um, command and control management of the radio spectrum. Um, in the administration, it, it all ha under the president, it goes through the Department of Commerce which has a sub-agency called the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. And within NTIA, there's a committee called IRAC, the Interagency Radio Advisory Committee, I believe it is, um, which is like a committee that has representation from all the federal agencies. And so that is like the group that decides how to allocate um, spectrum between the federal agencies, among which Department of Defense really is the biggest, most powerful um, player. Um, but um, within that, or after Department of Defense, you have NASA and NOAA that does weather satellites and FAA and um, Department of Homeland Security and the Justice Department, because like the law enforcement uses a lot of spectrum too. Department of Transportation. Um, so you can, and then a lot of the scientific um, agencies like NIST and NASA, they use a lot of spectrum too. So um, you have the whole federal apparatus and then you have ind independent agency, um, the Federal Communications Commission that handles commercial spectrum. Um, and they're, they have oversight by Congress, but they're independent of the executive branch. And so you have um, a lot of interchange um, and you have a memorandum of understanding between the FCC and the NTIA for how they manage federal and non-federal spectrum allocations between the two. Um, and then under the executive branch, you have involvement by um, well, obviously, it's the president at the top that decides um, executive decisions between the agencies, but the Office of Management and Budget 
does a lot of the the financial planning and money budgeting um, decision making and and so you have them involved OMB they they handle valuation and scoring um, of the budget um, but you also have the Office of Science and Technology so there, and then you have yeah Department of Commerce the Commerce Secretary at the cabinet level and so you have a lot of different um, players in in the spectrum space. So um, spectrum valuation factors. So in addition to the actual um, location, well, location, like geography of the license, there are other factors that go into the value, how valuable a particular license could be. Um, and so I'll just walk through these factors. Um, so what drives the value of a spectrum license as observed in auction transactions and secondary market sales? Um, is it the size of the band, like how many um, megahertz it is, the use of the band, what type of technology is used on it, the market location, like which markets, like a big city, New York, LA, um, or a rural location? Is it the band plan, the, the type of use that's being um, uh, designed on the band, or, or where on the dial it is, up, upper bands or lower bands? So economists have studied data from transactions in the U.S. and globally and um, have, have determined different um, weights or drivers for valuation. Um, it, it varies by um, auction to auction and as technology changes, but there are certain observations generally known um, of, about these factors. Um, and so frequency, mobile devices, um, as seen in the in the big auctions, have generated the most economic value, or maybe not economic, but uh, monetary value and economic value in terms of total uh, social welfare and commercial revenue, as um, deployed on certain frequencies that have favorable propagation characteristics for mobile networks. Um, the particular frequencies of a spectrum license thus drives value because the um, particular frequency is matched with the, the device, that the hardware that's used on that frequency. And so um, when I said economic value earlier, I mean, you know, there, there's economic, well, there's national security value to having a radar um, radar unit at, on the coast to protect national security. Um, you, I don't know if that is valued if you can even compare that value with a mobile network, I mean, you you can um, with if if you if you really wanted to, um, but um, yeah, that's why it's hard to compare apples and oranges on the spectrum. Um, but in terms of, I mean, that's a a very extreme case, like a radar system. Um, but there are a lot of there's a lot of a gray area, like um, right next to the radar system, there's a lot of white space that's not used. And so can that be used for valuable commercial use? Sure, if you can't, if it doesn't interfere with the radar network, you know, how much economic value could be used from that unused space? So um, that's what I mean by economic value. Um, paired versus unpaired. So aside from the frequency of a band, the structure of a band plan can also facilitate certain technologies and uses. So um, mobile devices with two-way communications have been designed to transmit signals on paired bands. So um, uh, bands that are have two different um, channels next to each other um, in order and those paired bands um, transmit by diminishing interference from incompatible adjacent operations. Um, in contrast, unpaired bands um, might not have the structure to really help um, two-way communications. It might be might introduce more interference. And so, having band plans that allow for these two-way communications can be more valuable um, to the bidders. In the AWS 3 auction, the FCC asked the public to comment on how to design the band plan for 1673, 75 megahertz to 1710 megahertz 
and um, they focused on 15 or 20 megahertz in the upper portion of the band from 1690 to 1710 um, and 1695 to 1710. So they wanted to know whether um, and how to design a band plan that would um, that would best facilitate um, two-way communications. And so these design engineering decisions um, are directly related to the economic value um, of the band. Other factors are whether the band is encumbered or unencumbered. So encumbrances are often uncertainty about whether interference will happen, um, if there are other users or incumbents on the band, if there are other rules like um, attached to the band. Um, so uncertainty in particular can lower the desirability of spectrum licenses for commercial operations. Um, mobile operators often want just unencumbered, clear spectrum. They don't want to have to worry about avoiding certain uses or carving out or non-interference zones. Um, that's why the value of really clearing a band is so much higher, at least in, in, in auctions. Um, ideally, it would be better if we could auction encumbered spectrum or um, and so one professor, um, Thomas Hazlett, talks a lot about overlay licenses. Um, why not um, auction off a license with encumbrances, but overlay and give rights to the, the winning bidder to negotiate with those encumbrances and handle it internally. So instead of um, spending a lot of time at the FCC trying to figure out how to clear a band, which takes like years of political um, negotiations and, and um, strategic maneuvering. Um, he suggests that, well, if the winning bidders could had authority to negotiate with the encumbrances, if you create some vertical integration there, then, um, then these things could happen much faster. Um, the FCC has implemented some overlay licenses, but not as much. Um, as, as he would like or has argued for. Um, and so that's, that's the encumbered versus unencumbered debate. Um, and, and those are factors on how valuable a spectrum band can be. Other factors are international harmonization. So whether a certain band has um, like global usage. So um, like certain bands for 5G and also cellular are used across the world in the same way. And so hardware is designed for those certain bands. And then, and thus, because the hardware is designed for that band, um, the value of that band goes up. And so that's called international harmonization. Um, the devices are manufactured at scale to serve larger user bases. And so you have network effects and then those bands become more valuable. Bands that you know, don't have as much usage on a global scale might not be as valuable in an auction. And then you have license versus unlicensed spectrum. Um, unlicensed spectrum isn't auctioned off um, right now, but um, exclusive use um, license spectrum is. And so you see the value of exclusive use spectrum. Unlicensed spectrum is valuable. I mean, Wi-Fi, there's so much economic activity that happens on Wi-Fi, um, but it's not priced. Um, we don't know the price of it, at least at, at auction. Um, so some proponents say that, well, because so much economic activity happens on Wi-Fi, therefore, you know, more spectrum should be unlicensed than licensed. Um, but deciding whether um, a certain amount of spectrum should be licensed or unlicensed is also an open question. Right now, the FCC kind of decides um, case by case, and um, some economists um, have argued that maybe there should even be a bid bidding mechanism for whether a band should be licensed or unlicensed. So go back one even more one more step to step zero even have bid bidders bid on whether a band, if they want the band to be licensed or unlicensed. 
And then um, you go on to the next auction to license the to to auction the licenses out. Um, but currently, the prior step deciding whether a band is licensed or unlicensed it does not happen at auction. So, what was written in two thousand nine is still true today. At present, no existing market mechanism allows for the trading of radio spectrum between licensed and unlicensed uses. Whenever a spectrum is made available for reallocation, the FCC faces a dilemma in determining which access regime to use. And so there are trade-offs in using a particular band for license or unlicensed use, and maybe a market mechanism could help determine those trade-offs better than the method that's currently used, which is uh, lobbying at the FCC right now. And so more on this license versus unlicensed debate. Regulators are currently attempting to guess how much bandwidth should be allocated to various types of licensed and unlicensed services and imposing different rules within and across those, these allocations. And that quote is from uh, an academic article um, cited in the reference section of the handout. And some scholars have been calling for a more systematic market-based way of deciding these allocation trade-offs. Um, some of the writers, um, scholars who've been calling for this are Tom Hazlett and Scott Walston. And um, it's undisputed that unlicensed spectrum, particularly bands under the fi Part 15 rules, generate enormous economic value through Wi-Fi. But there are unlicensed bands um, that have not been used well and that are just not used, that are lying fallow. So you hear success stories about the current Wi-Fi devices, but there are other unlicensed bands on other parts of this uh, frequency dial that have been set aside and not licensed off, but they're not being used. Um, and other valuation factors, I've discussed non-market values, so national security and other values influence the way that spectrum is compared to each other. And so that's one challenge of comparing federal spectrum with non-federal spectrum. Um, federal spectrum, a lot of which is used by the Department of Defense, um, has non-market values. Um, and so you see that there are efforts by DOD and Commerce Department and the commercial sector to find ways to, um, to, to, alloc to reallocate federal spectrum that's really not being used um, by the gov federal government or Defense Department. Um, and and move it to the commercial sector. <laughs>